Welcome everyone to our Monday research seminar. Today we're excited to have our, our own um, PhD student, almost um, complete, who's almost completed with her work, Stacy Widock, uh, who's a PhD student in Learning and Mind Sciences. Um, I will I will quickly turn turn it over to Stacy so she can get us started and um, share some of her work with us. Thank you. Okay, thank you all for coming today. Um, so the what I'm going to focus on today is um, an article that I have under review with the Journal of Basic Writing right now that focuses on um, sort of a subsection of my dissertation research. Um, and so I'm ex I'm looking at faculty and administrative perspectives on the ecology of assessment within a developmental writing course. Um, so diving right in, I think. Oh no. <laughs> okay. Um, so the context of this article and the dissertation more broadly is the Workload 99 program and the entry level writing requirements at what I'm calling UC Sierra, which is the University of California campus. So from uh, 1999 to 2017, the Workload 99 program provided courses for students to fulfill the UC system system wide requirement called the entry level writing requirements which is a, um, so students have to fulfill this requirement within their first year, unless they are placed into additional developmental coursework, um, such as language support coursework or something like that. So this was formerly known as the subject A requirement. And this requirement has existed in some form within the University of California system since its inception in 1869. Senate regulation 636 governs the entry level writing requirements and it defines it as a reading and writing proficiency requirement. So about 30% of students um, come in unfulfilled for entry, the entry level writing requirement uh, when they matriculate to their UC campus. Um, and that's about system wide. And then about 35% to 40%, depending on the year at UC Sierra, matriculate without having fulfilled the entry level writing requirement. And each UC has their own sort of set of procedures to support students in fulfilling this requirement once they've matriculated. So for nearly 30 years, the only course that fulfilled the entry level writing requirement at UC Sierra was Workload 99. Um, Workload 99 was a non-credit bearing developmental writing course. And prior to 1993, students could take a course titled Subject A or English A at UC Sierra to fulfill their requirements. But in 1993, due to an ongoing budget crisis in the system, um, Subject A courses at UC Sierra were outsourced to a local community college um, that I'm calling Grasslands Community College and was the course was renamed Workload 99. So from this point forward, um, Workload 99 courses were taught on campus at UC Sierra by adjunct instructor, instructors from GCC, about 93% or about 94% of instructors who taught in the program were part-time adjuncts um, on quarterly contracts. And during this time, the Workload 99 program was directed by a woman named Anita, who had been the director of Subject Day prior to the outsourcing um, since about 1983. So she had a good 30 years or so um, until she retired in 2016 or 17, I believe. So curriculum and Workload 99 courses um, were largely based on the UC Systems Analytical Writing Placement Exam. A 2018 program review attributes low pass rates and high instances of students repeating the course to the curriculum in Workload 99 because it was so centered on the test. So until 2006, students had to pass the final um, AWPE style final exam in Workload 99 in order to fulfill the entry level writing requirements. So students could otherwise pass workload 99, but if they failed the final exam, they had to retake the course in order to take the exam again. In 2006, that requirement was changed by a motion in the Academic Senate, um, allowing students to pass workload 99 with just a C or better in order to fulfill the entry level writing requirements. But the AWPE remained the final in the course and remained a huge force in the curriculum as well, which I'll discuss um, in more detail. So the analytical writing placement exam was designed by faculty across the UC system in 1986 to replace the subject A exam, which had, a, had different forms throughout its history. 
The AWPE though is a holistically scored single response timed writing exam and students are provided with a passage of writing and a series of questions to read and respond to in two hours. There are a variety of issues with the AWPE, um, starting with the fact that it hasn't changed since 1986, um, and that passages are often long and cover complex constructs that are difficult for student domestic students to, um, to relate to, let alone students from other cultures. The rubric for the AWPE also heavily emphasizes elements of standardized edited American English, um, and then students who uh, are multilingual may be identified through what's called an e-score um, as needing additional language support, and those e-scores are automatic failures of the exam. So during um, the statewide proctoring, that happens during the statewide proctoring sessions of the exam. Um, so this, the exam is proctored statewide across proctoring centers in California. And then it's also was um, administered quarterly at UC Sierra um, for a number of years. So the AWPE, therefore, given all of these structures, acts often as a gatekeeper, as a gatekeeper for many incoming UC students, and in particular students at UC Sierra, who were then placed into workload 99 by failing the exam. So my study. Um, pulls from an, uh, a number of areas of research, one of which is ecological models of writing assessments. Um, over the last few decades, ecological models of assessment have been prominent in writing studies literature as scholars have considered the ways that institutional and programmatic structures enable systemic racism and linguistic discrimination to manifest in writing curriculum and in instructional practices. Um, so ecological models consider um, writing assessment within these larger institutional, programmatic, and ideological systems. So Reef et al. note that it, uh, ecological models illuminate how discourses, writers, texts, utterances, and material and immaterial objects um, form networks of dynamic interaction. And then in a way theorizes what an anti-racist writing assessment ecology might look for and argues that it would account for interrelations between environments, individuals, and objects quote, without denying and alighting linguistic, cultural, and racial diversity and the politics inherent in uneven social formations. Another area of research I pulled from was critical systems thinking from our own um, Dan Melzer. Um, in his 2013 article, he defined systems thinking as a methodological process that considers the relationships between a system and super systems that shape it and influence it, with super systems being systems that are beyond the system in question, um, but that affect that system and how it operates. So critical systems thinking goes a step further by infusing critical stances in regards to race, gender, and class and by making explicit the ideologies of stakeholders and the ideologies reinscribed by systems. I also looked at literature related to exit exams in developmental writing um, programs, and there's not a ton of research in this area. Um, so Malloy in 2012 traces the role of Mina Shaughnessy, who is a major figure in developmental writing research. Um, and in the sort of one of the founders of basic writing as a field. Um, he traces the role that she played in the establishment of an, a high stakes exit exam in the CUNY system in the 1970s. And it appears that from the CUNY system, exit exams um, spread across the country to various programs. They may be more common in two year colleges, but there's not a ton of research in this area. So it's hard to tell whether or not um, these, uh, these exit exams are very common or not. In fact, that dearth of research on exit exams has been particularly prominent in the last couple of decades. And Yancey and Malloy both argue that the field of writing studies largely moved on from time writing exams um, toward po portfolio assessment by the late 1980s. Um, they use this to suggest that the field itself has moved on from time writing exams. But my question is whether the distributed nature of college writing instruction across the US makes it difficult for writing studies researchers to account for the diversity of different structures, programs, and institutions in which writing is taught and assessed. 
It's also important that the sort of disciplinary backgrounds and familiarity of writing studies, literature, and those in charge of developmental writings can be really diffuse. Uh, many folks who direct writing de uh, developmental writing programs may not even consider themselves writing studies researchers, and so their access to field within the literature or to literature within the field um, may be more or less depending. So my sort of larger questions guiding this study are thinking about to what extent then has this perception of moving on within the literature of the field been reflected on the ground? And in particular, I'm wondering in what ways might timed writing and high stakes writing exams drive curriculum and instruction in some developmental writing programs and classrooms and in institutions across the country? So digging into the study itself, I had four major research questions that guided my analysis in this particular part of the study. Um, so I looked at how do participants perceive of the goals and purposes of Workload 99 courses. I looked at what institutional programmatic and pedagogical structures shape Workload 99 curriculum. I also considered what role disciplinary professional and institutional identity may play in the structure of workload 99 and how participants enacted its curricula. And then I considered what tensions or alignments existed between faculty and administrators and the institution um, in regards to workload 99 work. The methodological framework for the study was institutional ethnography, which is a feminist sociological method methodology that considers how institutional structures, practices, and norms both shape and are shaped by the everyday experiences and perceptions of individuals within those institutions. In writing studies research in particular, LaFrance and Nichols, Nicholas um, explain that uh, institutional ethnography research reveals how things happen, including the practices and norms that embody institutions and the discourses that enable and constrain those practices and norms, and how those practices and norms might speak to, for, or over individuals. Um, and LaFrance also operationalizes um, the concept of boss text within institutional ethnography, um, which considers the ways that texts reify ideas values, languages, rhetorical frameworks, and notions of ideal practice and affiliation that might mediate and shape the work being done in writing programs. Data collection for the study included 10 faculty and two administrator participants, most of whom were held contingent positions. An interview protocol was then designed to address three major areas, including institutional and community concerns, goals, purposes, and perceptions of workload 99 courses and students, and perceptions of recent curricular and assessment changes that had been ongoing in the Workload 99 program. I also examined archival and institutional programmatic documents related to Workload 99 in order to contextualize information that I um, received through the interviews. This is just a quick um, look to at um, my data analysis. So um, I looked in data analysis, I, um, I listened to audio recordings and um, transcribed, inter read through transcribed interviews and came out with um, sort of open coding that I then refined later through more coding passes um, through the transcribed interviews. And this is an example of a category and one code within that category, how I defined it, and then examples, clear examples of what this code would look like. So moving on to the main findings of the study, there's four primary findings of this research. Um, the first was that the Workload 99 curriculum was highly restrictive and uh, heavily influenced by um, the analytical writing placement exam. So the emphasis on the analytical writing placement exam created a culture of failure within the program and friction emerged between faculty and administrators because of conflicting perceptions of purpose of workload 99 courses. And these um, sort of conflicts and friction were all also exacerbated by deficit perspectives within the UC and within program administrators towards students and faculty in workload 99. So there was a preoccupation, several faculty participants know a preoccupation with the analytical writing placement exam from program administrators and UCCR as an institution. So Sharon notes that Anita, who was the program director throughout this entire period of time, 
um, was really in, interested in sort of, quote, protecting the integrity of the exam, and that she would often mention that in meetings. Um, Sarah mentioned feeling very micromanaged and smothered um, in the sense that you only have this one type of assignment that a faculty could teach over and over again. Um, Sharon had been a veteran teacher within the program and would have seen Anita sort of mentioning this interest in protecting the integrity of the exam um, over the years, whereas Sarah was a more recent um, addition to the faculty pool and mentioned feeling very surprised by how micromanaging um, the program felt to her. There was also an interest in maintaining the standards um, of subject A. So a 2004 program review notes that the policy requiring that students pass the exam in order to pass the entry level writing requirements, making it so that they had to pass the exam, the exam despite maybe having um, passed the course, um, was instituted in order to keep control over the subject A standard firmly within the university, which alone sets the bar for passing the requirements. Um, similarly, minutes from a 2006 meeting of UC Sierra's Academic Senate note that, quote, using the AWPE exam in this way and having it graded by both GCC and UC Sierra Unit 18 faculty was apparently done in an attempt to ensure that outsourcing the course would not lead to a reduction in the quality of instruction. So in this way, the exam requirement was born from a fundamental distrust of the ability of a writing course to accurately determine writing proficiency. Um, as a timed writing exam would be able to, as well as distrust of or skepticism of the quality of faculty working in California's community colleges. The AWPE was really um, sort of ubiquitous in the curriculum of Workload 99. Faculty reported a heavy emphasis on the genre of summary response, which was the primary genre of the AWPE. Um, they also note an emphasis on the AWPE uh, meant that the AWPE's rubric became the dominant assessment tool for both in and out of class assignments. So the AWPE rubric emphasizes elements of standardized edited American English um, and the use of the AWPE rubric in 1999 meant that these uh, or in workload 99 meant that these elements became the focal point of assessment and instruction within the course. So for take home writing, Anita had designed an out of class rubric that was also based on the six points of the AWPE scoring guide um, that basically transcribed those six points in some way or fashion onto an A through F scale. And then the granularity of the out of class rubric left little room for faculty to teach anything other than summary response in order to use the required rubric in, um, in those assignments. So faculty note that uh, they some of them attribute the rigid focus of the AWPE to Anita. Um, and Sharon notes that she was very static and unchanging when it came to how the AWPE was incorporated into workload, workload 99 courses. Sarah describes bloody faculty meetings is how she, uh, how she defines them as these moments when faculty were sort of battling with each other over how to assess um, or norm particular examples of student writing. And she, she notes this sort of um, ways that faculty became uh, sort of policers of each other's work or each other's instruction um, by noting that the, uh, there had to be uniformity across the program. Um, and she kind of attributes these to folks being there for too long. Um, and it is of note that um, there were many faculty members who had been teaching in the program for a number of years. Um, Sharon, for example, had been teaching in the program for over 30 years. Lynn, um, who was an interesting participant in that she had taught in the UC Sierra's English A program before it was outsourced in the 1980s, had taken a couple of decades off and then come back and was teaching in the Workload 99 program. And she notes that she was astonished to come back and see the same textbooks and the same process and the same final. And she, she notes that I've taught in many different programs in schools and never have I seen a program where there's just no evolution or change. So deficit perspectives of students were infused into programmatic documents and curricular documents and assessment documents. 
Um, and so this is an example of a quote from a grading guideline that was developed by GCC and UC Sierra administrators that was given to faculty as a way to consider how to grade students um, in workload 99. Um, and so this, uh, this grading guideline basically um, suggests to faculty that students should not receive grades over a D at the beginning of the quarter, and that it was very uncommon to see Bs or As in workload 99 at all, but certainly not in the first few weeks. Um, I believe documents like this would have also primed faculty to be more critical in how they assess student work um, by suggesting to them that they should always consider grading down um, as opposed to considering um, any other factors. So um, these grading documents were then discussed in faculty meetings and reinforced by peers um, when they normed student essays during those faculty meetings. Those faculty meetings often happen, happened quarterly um, and they were really um, instrumental in how new faculty were brought into um, and instructed on how to approach teaching workload 99. So all of this engendered a culture of failure. Faculty reported getting the impression from program administrators that they should generally grade workload 99 students lower. And several also reported feeling pressure from their peers to do so. Several reported feeling that their peers were harsher graders than they were or that they felt they were themselves. So this um, segment here is a quote from Sarah where she discusses um, attending her first set of faculty meetings and how she found out that she was really grading the students much higher than her peers would have graded them. Um, and she left the meeting feeling with the impression that, quote, you're going to fail a lot of people in this class. You're going to fail a lot of people. Um, and Emily also echoes this. Emily was a lecturer in UC Sierra's, uh, at UC Sierra, but she also taught Workload 99. Um, and she discussed feeling that she was a lot more lenient than a lot of her peers and how she felt really uncomfortable with that because the AWPE final was graded through a group, group grading process where instructors were not allowed to grade their own students' finals. Instead, other faculty in Workload 99 graded them um, for them. And so Emily notes that she felt that her peers were flunking a lot of her students that didn't really need workload again, and that she had students who had been getting B pluses or A minuses up until the final, and then she was somehow required to figure out mathematically how to final how to fail them. Um, Emily's interview was full of, a, of moments when she's trying to figure out the math of how she would be able to fail a student who had previously had an A in the class. Emily also notes um, that she felt targeted by program-wide emails that um, mentioned that faculty were passing too many students. So she notes that I would look at um, what her students were doing in workload and say that I can't flunk these students. It doesn't make any sense to flunk them. And so I'd pass them and then I'd get these emails. Um, the presence of these program-wide emails discussing student um, pass rates in relation to pass rates on the exam were mentioned by a number of faculty. So they were clearly sort of preoccupying the minds of faculty as they were teaching within the program. Um, Henry, who had spent years um, abroad as an EFL instructor, notes that he felt that we that the program in particular engendered a culture of fear within ESL students. Um, and he notes hearing from students use of the word terror in regard to the AWPE and workload 99 courses in particular. So the, um, the intense focus on the AWP within the curriculum appeared at times to cause conflict between stakeholders as um, administrators felt that the AWPE was a measure of whether student workload 99 students were college ready. So in their minds, the AWPE style final became a sort of necessary gatekeeper ensuring that um, workload 99 students could not continue on to other composition or writing requirements at UC Sierra without having shown proficiency on the AWPE in particular. Um, on the other hand, when I asked faculty participants about their perceptions of the goals and purposes of workload 99 courses, most of them described the courses as providing 
students with an opportunity to practice and develop important skills and conventions of college reading and writing. Um, however, many faculty felt that the focus on the AWPE um, made this difficult for them to focus on practice and development. So Emily notes that she never saw my students as needing to get a B or an A in the class, they just needed to get a C. They're still trying to figure, figure this out. Um, so Melzer notes that um, when considering systems thinking in regards to writing programs, we should look beyond individual actors within the system and consider um, and focus on systemic oppression in its, and its relation to the conceptual model that underlies the system and that the system normalizes. So focusing less on particular actors like Anita and focusing more on the ways that institutional structures and ideologies embedded within the larger institution of UC Sierra and the University of California system may be reinscribed within workload 99 courses. What was interesting to me is that when I asked Anita to define in her mind what the purpose of workload 99 courses were, she defines them as, as she notes that even though workload 99 was traditionally considered a remedial course, it was not truly remedial. It was a course that taught university level materials with the idea of preparing students well. In some ways, Anita, who was a member of the original team that had developed the AWPE, likely saw the AWPE as a tool for doing exactly this. But it also demonstrates the ways that her perception of the course was really different from how faculty perceived it and the ways that it um, impacted students. It's also in, important to note that for an institution invested in preserving its elite status like the UC system, the idea that some students admitted to UC Sierra might need additional support and preparation for college writing meant that the focus of such courses must be like most remedial courses on guaranteeing students proficiency in relation to the standards set by the institution, rather than a space for learning and development for students. So the use of the AWPE and Workload 99 underscores the importance of resisting a view of assessment instruments and practices that as colorblind, and also considering the ways that assessment ecologies and writing classes um, encompass institutional structures that enable and embed deficit and often racist ideologies in curriculum assessment and instructional practices. So um, considering the end of an era in a sense, um, the Workload 99 program ended in 2021. Um, a 2018 program review, um, sorry, a 2018 program review and task force report created ideal conditions for successfully piloting new credit bearing two and four unit courses at UC Sierra in 2019. So as of 2021, the partnership between GCC and workload or GCC and UC Sierra has ended and workload 99 courses have been discontinued. The UC system also interestingly around the same time um, decided to retire the AWPE or the system-wide proctoring of the AWPE at least with its final administration taking place in May, 2022. Um, their explanation for this was uh, the cost of the exam, um, but there had been mounting criticism of the AWPE from campuses across the UC system for several years prior to this decision. So some key takeaways thinking about implications of this research are that writing programs are often sites of conflicting epistemologies. I mentioned at the beginning of this um, presentation that writing programs are often, uh, or instructors, teachers within writing programs, and even writing program administrators may not often come from backgrounds in writing studies. Um, and so considering the ways that different epistemologies may impact uh, writing programs is important for writing program administrators. Um, I think that ecological models and systems thinking can help writing program administrators better understand the role that these diverging epistemologies may play in the classroom and how they might come out in the way that curriculum is enacted by instructors. 
Um, WPA should also consider their own internalized biases and institutional identities and how these things might influence how they perceive faculty and students. Um, the consideration community college faculty that I interviewed for this study often noted feeling like they were looked down upon by um, administrators or even other faculty who worked within the UC. Um, and the, the administrator that I interviewed from um, Grasslands Community College also mentioned this note, uh, feeling that there was sort of a, an internalized bias within UC administrators against community college faculty which may have influenced the way, uh, the restrictive nature of the curriculum and the, the ways that it remains sort of the same over time. And knowledge gained through this type of examination, I think is crucial to combating ongoing austerity within higher education, sort of understanding how these systems work and um, modernizing basic writing programs if in fact they are still using exit exams in similar ways to Workload 99. Um, is a crucial step in um, maintaining writing programs as important figures within um, post-secondary institutions. And that's the end. <laughs> so any questions? Thank you. Thank you, Stacy, for that presentation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's so any questions, please unmute or just first mm -hmm. um so this this new iteration of the data and analysis i think has come so far and it's great opening statement but <laughs> as you were as you were talking it through and positioning it this way uh, i was struck by the parallel that i don't think is always emphasized in the work you're doing with the data between the direct assessment movement right in like the 80s ish mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of directly assessing student writing versus student learning, mm -hmm. right, embedded in that model, and the direct assessment of faculty, especially uh, the Workload 99 faculty, like that the, the AWPE is a proxy for both. Mm -hmm. The direct assessment of student writing, again, not learning, but writing, mm -hmm. and not, not learning about writing, um, yeah. and direct assessment of faculty instruction or adherence to the standards. So I'm wondering what you make of that parallel, like how, how could that be useful for us to examine that? I think that's a really good point you're making. Mm -hmm. It's implicit still, I think, in this moment right. about right. those parallel direct assessment moves. What do you think? Yeah, so I think one interesting thing about Workload 99 was that um, faculty essentially, as you're sort of getting at Trish, faculty essentially were assessed on how well they stuck to the curriculum, how well they basically taught, you know, eight essays, had many of them be in, in class essays, how often they use the rubric, their use of the textbook. So they were assessed on how well they stuck to the curriculum that had been prescribed by um, UC Sierra administrators and definitely not on their um, instruction within those classes. There was no observation of faculty. Um, there was no, there were no um, ev course evaluations uh, that students, students could not um, provide course evaluations uh, of Workload 99 courses. Um, there's sort of a famous example of students doing a change.org um, protest of a faculty member because they had no other outlet through which they could express frustration with what was happening in the class or feelings about it or anything. Um, so I think that, um, I don't know if that's getting at what you're talking about, but I think it's it's really important thinking about how valuable things like observation and direct, um, if not evaluation, like direct sort of development, not developmental, but, um, process-based, <laughs> um, you know, review of faculty work is for developing as a teacher um, and how little UC Sierra faculty uh, 
how little workload 99 instructors got of that. Um, they were handed a curriculum, they were told to teach it, and they were essentially assessed on how well they did exactly that. Yeah, I'm struck that 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 one of the takeaways is also that there that it seems like there are conflicting epistemologies. You're right. Mm -hmm. And we should be looking for them, but there were also the ones that this weird alignment that was happening that I think would have been harder to see if you didn't have the institutional ethnography components. Right. Help you. So, right. Yes. Yeah. Hi, Cynthia. Cynthia, you're muted. Okay, there we go. <laughs> I thought I'd click the button. Um, yeah, so so my question is is really about sort of the takeaways and um, what might be next for for well for some of our sister campus programs, frankly, right? Because you mentioned the fact that that the AWPE is going away, <laughs> and so we have these other campuses that now not only do they have to come up with an alternative, but they have to deal with the fact that um, this thing that formerly sort of you know loomed large is now absent, right? What mm -hmm. happens? And so and so I wonder what what you might think about or encourage such programs to consider in thinking about now having the absence of this, what probably functioned as somewhat of a boss text for them too, frankly. Yeah. Um, and and now having to undergo some amount of well maybe institutional change maybe they'll just come up with another thing to sort of take its place i don't know mm -hmm. but um and in thinking about the order of events that happened in the program that you were studying um that you know the test didn't go away first right, right. <laughs> and so right. um yeah you know like what what kinds of if you had to give advice like what kinds of things would you think that such programs should consider now right so I think it's it's really valuable. You noted that the test didn't go away first. I think what what was really valuable in um, at this particular institution was considering what developmental writing, what the purpose of developmental writing was for students at that institution. So it started first by considering what we wanted developmental writing courses to be able to do. What, how they should serve students, what purpose they serve for those students, and reconsidering that um, and redesigning those courses to achieve those purposes, thinking about providing students with access to um, opportunities to practice different forms of college writing, to consider academic literacy tax, tasks and better understand them. So it's really started from trying to think about um, what students needed in terms of developmental writing. And then the consideration later of how best to place students accurately in those classes um, came after and was precipitated by, you know, this opportunity that COVID gave us of the AWPE um, really not being able to be proctored in person. So I think my sort of advice to our sister campuses would be to consider um, what the landscape of developmental writing looks like on their campuses, how it interrelates or doesn't with first year writing and vertically with you know, upper division writing um, on those campuses. And in what ways can you, if you are now you know, faced with the prospect of having to come up with a new placement model, how can you develop a placement model that's going to best serve students um, in, in regards to those, you know, in regards to what they need in terms of developmental writing or not? Um, so I hope that answers your question. Stacey, thank you. Yeah, thank you for, for the talk. Um, so I was wondering, um, and maybe this is a sort of a continuation of your answer to, to Cynthia, but I was wondering about the implications of your study for writing assessment, and not just within the UCs, but sort of more broadly. And I mean, I noted not only your citing of Dan's work, but like Asal in a way, in a way, and Poe are in there, these stances towards anti racist writing assessment techniques. And I was wondering, like, what you thought in terms of writing assessment, sort of writ large within the US and Canada, like, 
are there implications about how large scale writing assessment, you know, like statewide writing assessment for all the UCs, how that type, how those types of programs should be reformed? Are there things that you see from UC Sierra that might be promising in terms of going forward? Like, what does this mean um, in terms of writing assessment as a field? particularly if there's a break away from this sort of grotesque driving of the curriculum by a single timed writing exam. Right. Well, I think I'll return to one of my sort of earlier contentions, which is I think that there's a, a habit in writing studies research to assume that, if, if not assume, um, to, to feel on some level that the directions that the scholarship is moving are mirrored on the ground. And I think that that's often not true. Um, and so, you know, what might be happening within writing programs around the country might be very different from what writing studies researchers are, are like the directions that they're moving in in terms of race and writing assessment. So yes, we're calling out as a field these large scale assessments in the ways that they are actively racist and the ways that they discriminate towards students of color and first generation students and students from non-dominant language backgrounds, but they're still very much in use. Um, I think uh, in Toth in maybe 2019 mentions that um, most community colleges still use some form of um, high stakes exam, be it a high stakes writing exam or something like the SAT or the ACT in order to place students in writing courses. So I think I would urge the field to really consider um, the fact that scholarship may not mirror what's happening on the ground. And that, and I think that's really behind my sort of larger question about how prominent are exit exams still in developmental writing? Has, have many programs moved on to portfolio assessment? Um, in what ways is Workload 99 not an outlier. How might it sort of represent some of things, some of the things that are happening across the country? I'll give one quick example. Um, I was at an institution a couple of weeks ago um, that I wouldn't say necessarily mirrors Workload 99, but has a lot of the same kinds of structures. Um, and this was a state college. So I think that um, in, in terms of answering your question, Carl, I think I would start there by urging the field to really consider um, what ways can we make our research, um, how, can we, how can we start to get the theories that we've spent so much time developing in the literature, how can we help institutions move in that direction um, as well? And that's a big question, I realize. <laughs> so. Any other questions, comments? All right. Well, I want to thank Stacy for your presentation. Uh, we just really want to highlight the work on the writing program faculty as well. And, 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 and I always talk about how I know so much more because of our students in the writing program and, and thinking about assessments. I really appreciate the work that you're doing, Stacey, and other folks in the writing program. Thank you all for joining us. Uh, we will have another talk in two weeks with um, our faculty member, um, Tony Albano. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you.